Well, Lord, we just come in the name of Jesus in this place. We are grateful that we can meet together, that we can gather together and spur one another on. And, and we just pray, Lord, that your spirit would be here speaking, moving as he already is. Just continue to do your work here in our midst. We're just vessels in your hand. Come and do what you will here in this place. Amen. Well, the last few, uh, last couple of years, Teresa and I, we've been reading through the Bible. Have anybody done that? Like, you know, you have an app and it tells you, read these verses and, and, uh, and then you get to check off the little boxes. That's my favorite part. Done. <laughs> and... We've been doing this for the last couple of years. This year, we're, listening, we're, we're uh, doing the Bible Project uh, Walk Through the Bible um, app. And we just so happen to be in the book of Daniel right now. And I thought it was really, really fitting, uh, given Barry's message last week when he was talking about the strongholds and tearing down strongholds. I thought it was really fitting today to continue that kind of concept um, through the eyes of Daniel. And, uh, and we, we can learn some great things about how to function in, uh, in times of exile. And I believe right now we're in a really unique time in Canada where, where the lines are being drawn. And we're, we're getting to that place where we are being pushed to the minority as believers, where our voices are not only not being listened to, but in fact they're being, they're being squelched. And the persecution is, is, is coming. As soon as we make a, a stand and we make, take a stand and say something that opposes the worldview, the current worldview, we are cut off, shut down. And I believe we're walking into a really unique time in our history. Uh, for Canadians particularly. I don't know about the rest of the world, but I, I know for sure here. I don't think I've ever experienced anything quite like this before. And so I thought it would be interesting to discover what, would it, what it would be like, especially as we've been reading uh, through Daniel. And here are two guys, or Daniel and, and a bunch of his friends, who were, who were taken into exile. And how did they... They didn't just survive. They actually flourished in exile. And I think that's what God was, is, is kind of hoping for us in this time. That, uh, I think we were, you know, when, when, when persecution comes upon the church, all of a sudden the gospel message has some potency to it. It's not just a bunch of fluff and little words that we say we believe, and then we go on and we live our lives just like everybody else. There's no more living our lives like everybody else because <laughs> we can't do it that way anymore. The lines are being drawn in the sand, and we have to choose one side or the other. <clears throat> and so I just thought to myself, how can we survive? How can we function? Not just survive, but, but thrive in the way of the exile. And oftentimes, you know, when you think of Daniel, and they, they got led to, the, to Babylon, and uh, you think, well, there's only two different ways you could two different choices. You can either stand up and fight or roll over and just surrender. But actually, there's a third way. And that's what I want to look at this morning. And to be honest, it actually comes from the video that the Bible Project guys... Do you guys all... Have you seen Bible Project videos? Because if you haven't, you'll see one today, and they're amazing. These guys are so brilliant, way smarter than I am, and so I'm actually stealing everything that they said here and just expounding on it. So here's the sermon in five minutes, and in fact, we could just watch the video and then just go home. I think that would probably be good. <laughs> but just watch this video, and we'll talk about it. <clears throat> in the year 587 BC, the city of Jerusalem was attacked by the Babylonian Empire. And a year later, the city and the temple were plundered and burned. Thousands of Israelites were taken from their homes and relocated all over ancient Babylon. They became exiles. And so now they're a minority surrounded by a new culture with new gods. 
Now some Israelites chose to resist Babylon by revolting or withdrawing. Others gave in, adopting the Babylonian way of life and accepting these new gods as their own. And you might think those are your only two options, but the prophet Jeremiah told them to do something totally different and surprising. To settle in, build houses, plant gardens, grow families, and most surprisingly, to seek the well-being of Babylon and pray to the Lord on its behalf. So this is like a third way. Yeah, it's not compromise or revolt. What does it look like? Well, there's a whole book of the Bible that explores that question. It's the story of Daniel. Daniel was one of the Israelites taken into the Babylonian exile. And because Daniel had a royal heritage and education, he was recruited along with some friends to work in the high court of Babylon. Work for the enemy? That would be compromise. Or they could gain the king's trust and take him down from the inside. That's what you might expect, but instead they take Jeremiah's advice and choose the third way. They serve the king of Babylon, taking on Babylonian names and even clothing style. So they seek Babylon's well-being, but in doing so, aren't they just giving up their heritage? It could seem that way, but actually, they aren't. As you read on, the story focuses on moments where they draw the line, and they choose faithfulness to their god and resist the influence of Babylon. So, for example? Well, like when they're commanded to bow down to the idol of Babylon and give allegiance to the king as if he's a god. Ah, uh, they won't go that far. Right. This is where you see their true loyalty. It requires them to critique Babylon's idolatry of power, its arrogance, its injustice, but they do it non-violently by laying down their lives. And so God vindicates Daniel and his friends for their faithfulness. So they would serve Babylon, seek its well-being, but their loyalty was always to God. Yeah, this is what Jeremiah was envisioning. The way of the exile is a combination of loyalty and also subversion. So they're still exiles, but don't Daniel and his friends long to go home? Yes. In fact, Daniel believed that God was going to send a ruler to bring down Babylon and create a true kingdom of peace. Ah, when did he think this ruler would come? Well, at first he thought within his lifetime, but then he had a dream where he found out that after Babylon would come another oppressive empire, then another, then another. And so Babylon did fall and Israel did get to go back home, but now they're ruled by Babylon's successors. And so they maintained the mindset of an exile waiting for their true home to come to them. And they continued the same practice of loyalty and subversion to any new versions of Babylon that came along. And this leads us to the time of Jesus. The empire of his day was Rome, ruled by Caesar. Now some Israelites wanted to resist, while others gave in and adopted Roman culture and its gods. But watch Jesus carry on the subversive loyalty of Daniel. Like when he said, it's fine to pay taxes to Caesar, give him back his coins. But then he said, don't mistake Caesar for God. God's the one who deserves your total life and allegiance. So the way of Jesus is this same mix of loyalty and subversion. Yeah, like he taught his followers to love and even bless their enemies. But he also got arrested for speaking out against the corrupt leaders of Jerusalem and Rome. He critiqued their idolatry of power and it cost him his life. But God vindicated him by raising him from the dead as the true king of the nations. The king that Daniel had hoped for. Right. And Jesus promised that one day his kingdom would prevail. And so until then, his followers are living in a type of exile. Yeah, this is why the Apostle Peter calls followers of Jesus foreigners and exiles. He told them to respect the authorities of whatever place you happen to live, to honor and love all people. But then he reminds them that this isn't their true home. They're still living in Babylon. But, well, they're not living in Babylon. Babylon doesn't exist anymore. Or does it? In the Bible, Babylon has become a symbol that describes any human institution that demands allegiance to its idolatrous redefinitions of good and evil. Okay, so we all live and work in Babylon. How do I seek the well-being of Babylon while my allegiance is to someone greater? Yes, Jesus' followers are called to live in that tension between loyalty and subversion. That's the way of the exile. And that's it. So it's good to have you here. You can, let's go have a coffee. No. <laughs> I just, they, they say it so well, don't they? That's such an amazing, uh, clear picture of what's happening. Do you feel like you're in exile a little bit? Do you feel that way? I think 
it's, it's feeling that way a lot more and more. I was listening to the radio as I was on, on my way to work, and they were mentioning that there was, uh, they're going to make some, uh, some new changes to how we vote. 60 different changes to, to make it more secure and make it more safe. And, and, uh, and one of those changes that they decided that they wanted to highlight in, uh, on the news was that no longer will they allow hate groups to participate in any leadership roles. Well, that sounds safe and good. But who's defining hate group? Who's defining that? And I'll tell you something, Christianity is being portrayed as a hate group. So the reality is we are stepping into some pretty significant moments in history. And I love the word that was given, Karen, about repentance because I think that's the whole point of exile. When we walk into exile is because we've, walked away from God. We've watered down our faith. We've abandoned what he's actually called us to be. It started in the garden. They were exiled from the garden because they chose to do their own thing. And it's, it's continued on all through history. You see it all through history, Genesis was the beginning. And then, and then in Exodus, the sons of Jacob, they became the nation of Israel and they found themselves in exile in Egypt for 400 years. Why? Because they rebelled against God and started serving idols. And then they're redeemed from there. And then the, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, eventually after they had gone to the promised land and, you know, God said, don't forget about me. And what did they do? They forgot about him. They started worshiping the idols and the different practices around them. And so they ended up in, in exile by, in, by Assyria. And then the southern kingdom of Israel, was, uh, which is what Daniel was a part of, they ended up in exile, taken by, in exile by Babylon. And so you can imagine, and then, of course, then from there, uh, in the Old Testament, they, they tried from uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, they tried to restore the wall and rebuild the temple, and it wasn't 100% fully restored, but then they're occupied by Rome, and they're in their homeland, but under the exile of a, of a, of a government that was oppressing them. sort of starting to feel that way around here. <laughs> so I was just imagining Daniel and his three buddies. We don't, we don't know their, uh, I, I, their, their names are famous for, because of the Babylonian names. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are their Babylonian names. Their real names are uh, Meshael, Hananiah, Ezariah. And Daniel, his name means God is my judge, but they gave him the name Belshazzar. May Marduk protect his life. So the God of Babylon, may he protect Daniel's life. You, you, like they, they are stripping these guys of their identity. They're stripping them of their identity, and it would be really hard. I don't know if I would be the kind of guy that would just say, okay, yeah, sure, give me that name. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I would... Oh, that would be a hard one. Mishael, who is like God. They just changed a few letters and they call him Meshach, who is like Aku, which is the moon god for Babylon. Hananiah, Lord shows grace. Shadrach is his new name in command of Aku. Ezra, Ezariah means the Lord's help. His new name, Abednego the servant of Nabu, which is the god, Babylonian god of wisdom. They are stripping them of their identity. They're making them wear the clothes of the, of the people. They hauled them off from their country, probably in chains, and it took four months to go from Jerusalem to Babylon. And they walk through these big gates. The, the, the gates themselves are about 50 feet high. Just That's the front door. And, uh, you know, because King Nebuchadnezzar, he was an architect and a builder. So he took great pride in making Babylon something spectacular. And so he, you know, he, 
there was a whole, we walked through this gate and there's a whole procession of, of these buildings and you can see the massive temples in the, in, the, in the background where they're headed. And this is their new world and their new identity. But they're not just treated like slaves, they're won over. You know, they're learning from the education system of Babylon. They're treated well. In fact, they're even given food that they, would, that, would, that they were feeding the royal families because they were training them up to be a part of the, 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 um, the king's right-hand men. And I think it would be really tempting to just say, you know what, this is a pretty good life. You know, our faith, our Jewish faith, it's come and gone. It's, maybe it's time to walk on and Try this instead. I know of a lot of people, I know of a few people personally, who have walked away from the Christian faith because it's just, I don't know, it sounds a little antiquated and I, don't, I can't get my head around the Old Testament. How could God be this way and that way? If God is love, then why does this happen? You've heard the questions, right? And people are walking away from the faith. Because this new Babylonian teaching sounds pretty good. And it's more inclusive anyways. <laughs> but that's not what they did. They did the third way. Where they not only... Actually, in, in Daniel chapter 9, it, it, uh, it says that he was reading the prophet Jeremiah. And I thought that was, sometimes I just am I'm mind boggled that I'm reading Jeremiah 29 and Daniel was reading Jeremiah 29. <laughs> That's amazing. And I'm, this is like thousands of years later and I'm reading what Daniel was reading. And does that ever cross your minds? Or I, I guess I'm just a little more simple minded than most people, but. <laughs> Ah, uh, I wrote it down. I can't. I, I'm going to do it this way. Yeah, I got to use the big print, you know. In uh, Jeremiah 29, it says in, in Daniel 9 that he was reading Jeremiah's account, and he was counting the number of days they had been in in uh, in captivity. And it says, uh, "This is what Jeremiah says. This is what the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel." says to all the captives he has, he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find some spouses for them so, they can, so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Who sent them into exile? God did. Pray to the Lord for that city, for its welfare will determine your welfare. That's wild. So Daniel's reading this, and he's like, that's what we're going to do. We are going to do that. And they begin to pray. And you know some of the stories, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they wouldn't bow down to the idol, so they get thrown into the furnace. And I, 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 I read it again. I won't take the time to read it, but I read it again the, the other day, and I was astounded that they, they went into this furnace, and they stood there until the king invited them back out. <laughs> okay, you can come out now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? And I just think that is just crazy. Like, I would be, uh, if I could get out of the fiery furnace, I'd be running for, <laughs> for dear life. But no, they went into the fiery furnace, and uh, even if they were tossed in, but they were, they were walking around, they were waiting in there until they had permission from the king to come out. That's how subversive they were. Crazy. And then, of course, fast forward a couple of kings later, King Darius, and he knew that Daniel would be praying because that's what Daniel does. He prays for Babylon. He prays for the people of Israel. He prays to his God. 
He's been doing this for all these years. He'll keep doing it. And so they make this decree. And he, anybody that prays to anybody but the King Darius is going to get thrown to the lions. And so what happens? Oh, he did this. He did this. He prayed to God instead of King Darius. And off he goes to the lions. Then God shuts the lions' mouths on and on. You, you, you know what I'm saying. And the thing that happens here through these stories is that it's not... God gets the glory. I love the king's responses both times in those stories. Truly, you serve the true living God. They're amazed. Why? Because they didn't just throw themselves, you know, they didn't rebel and they didn't freak out and they didn't fight. And it wasn't anything of their strength or anything of their power. It was God at work through them. And it was obvious because they, they didn't do anything. They, they just submitted until they, you know, until it crossed the line. And I love the way, you know, when we look at these kinds of things, we, I wanted to look at a few examples of Jesus as well. And because um, Jesus took the same, um, the same perspective of walking in exile Within, uh, within Jerusalem and within his time on earth. And uh, they touched on it in the video, Matthew 22, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You know, whose picture is on this coin? Well, it's Caesar's coin. Well, then give that back to Caesar. He's got his picture on it. <laughs> I think Jesus is really funny. I, I think he has such a sense of humor. And, and uh, the other one that I was looking at was Matthew 5. And um, this was part of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, let's just get there. And he's teaching them about the law. And of course, everyone knew, knew the law, but he's saying, yeah, well, you think you know the law. Well, you've heard that it was said this. Well, I tell you that. And so this is one of my favorites. It, it says, uh, oh. do I have to get my glasses? I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> you, <laughs> you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I just... <laughs> How many of us have find that very easy to do? That's the third way right? That's the third way. It's easy to love your neighbor. It's easy to love a friend. It's easy to love someone who loves you. But that's what everybody does. That's what it continues on saying, if I could read it properly. But that's what it goes on to say. But there's a third way. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I wonder who is on top of our prayer list, if that's the case. Another good one is Matthew 17. This, is, this, is, this, this one is about the temple tax. And he, uh, he's getting... The, the religious leaders of the time, they were very... Um, they didn't like Jesus. And so they were trying... And I can see why. I mean, he, he's, he, he's teaching them right now. I can't do this with this Bible. I've got to use the app with the big letters. <laughs> the temple tax was something that uh, the religious leaders had come up with to make some money. In fact, we might want to try that here. You know, if you know, the, it's kind of like admission to the to church, and um, you know, we might be able to actually do a building project or something like that if we did a. Uh, an improvement tax. We'll call it an improvement tax. And uh, no, we won't do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be bad. But uh, so he's, Jesus is, is uh, teaching. And he's saying stuff to, the, the, to everybody about uh, the, the corruptness of, of uh, religious leaders and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, in, in earshot of, of the Pharisees. So 
it's no wonder they wanted to crucify him because a lot of times he was pushing their buttons and he, I know he knew what he was doing. So, but I love this. This is here. This is how, I think this is, gives a little picture of Jesus' uh, sense of humor. So on their way to, to uh, on, uh, on their arrival in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Ooh. And uh, Peter's like, yeah, of, of course he does. Then, uh, uh, then he went into the house. But before he had a chance to speak, Jesus asked him, what do you think, Peter? Do, king, do kings tax their own people or the people that they have conquered? That was a good question. And Peter says, well, they tax the people that they have conquered. Well, then he said, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend them. So go on down to the lake, throw in a line, open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and pull out the silver coin and pay the temple tax with that. <laughs> what? That is the craziest story in the whole Bible. And I just think it's, it's so funny because God's just saying, look, it's a stupid little silly tax. But we don't want to offend anybody because that's, You want to be sub subversive to that. You don't want to, you don't want to offend them unnecessarily. So go catch a fish and get the money out of the thing's mouth and we'll pay it with that. I just think that's pretty funny. But that's, that's part of Jesus. He's, he's not going to unintention or, or um, unnecessarily offend the people around him. But he also won't bow to them. And fast forward, and now we're into uh, Jesus has died. He's risen. He's in glory, and he's, he's ruling on high. The Spirit of God has come. And, and now Peter is teaching the same thing through his teachings in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2. He says... Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners, is keep away from the worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority. I'm going to read that again. For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong or to honor those who do right. It is God's will that, you, that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are, not, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. Fear God. Respect the king. Those are good words to live by. They're challenging words to live by. And I don't, I don't stand here and claim that I, I've got that all figured out because it's, that's a hard thing to do. Especially when everything is flying in your face and you've got people that are accusing, they're accusing the church of things that, well, we're being falsely accused of things. Let's just put it that way. And sometimes there's truth to it, but the truth is taken out of uh, two extremes. We are definitely walking into a, a time of where we're experiencing the strongholds of our nations around us, oppressing and coming in and oppressing the, the, the Christian faith. And so I just, I just want to wrap things up with a few verses that, and a few thoughts. Like, how do we do this? How do we operate uh, choosing the third way? Not choosing the left or the right, but the Jesus way. How do we do that? We have to be humble. 
It takes humility to stand there and, and, you know, you can imagine Daniel receiving these clothes and a new name and, and, and serving the enemy nation. That takes a lot of humility. <laughs> In Philippians 2, verse 6, it talks about Jesus, how he didn't, uh, well, I better just go there. I'm going to, Otherwise, I'm going to preach heresy. Coming, it'll be coming out of my mouth. Better just read it. See, Teresa, she's memorized these. I'm not so spiritual, but... This is, uh, this is what, what uh, is taught through Philippians 2. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. See, I just did that about my wife. She's way better than me. <laughs> oh, but now that's not a very humble statement, so I got to re- rewind. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm digging myself in a hole. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think equality of God it was something to cling to. Instead, he gave it up. He gave up his divine privileges. He's, he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a, humble, as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. This is the attitude that we need to have. Walking in this third way also takes courage. It's not, something, it's not something that's just easy because as, as sooner or later the line is going to be drawn in the sand and we're going to have to take a stand. And in that moment, if we haven't prepared our hearts, we'll easily crumble. And so my challenge is to, to dig into your word, dig into your relationship with Jesus, get rooted and, and planted firmly in him because the moment will come when we have, we, we have a, a choice to make. And I know for me, I, I want to make the right choice. In 2 Timothy 1, it says that he hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that's how we function in that third way. And last is we have to be full of faith. And faith doesn't come from from drumming something up. Faith comes from, from uh, learning and exploring and learning from other people and learning from your own experiences. The older we get, the more we realize how faithful God is to us. The older we get, the, the more we realize he, he, you know, like that thing that happened to me back then when I questioned my faith, ah, oh, that's, This is the fruit of that now. We get to see something coming out of the tragedies. But faith is, according to Hebrews 11, is the assurance of things hoped for. The assurance of things hoped for. The disciples, or the the, the Old Testament prophets and all these people, they, you know, um, there's a whole list of them here. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah, on and on and on. But they never saw the fulfillment of it. We're walking and living in, in the day of fulfillment of this. And to me, we are in the, in the best experience we could possibly have, where we have this Bible, this book, the experiences of all the prophets and the, and the Old Testament teachers and the New Testament and, and the disciples that walked with Jesus. We have all of these things. <laughs> We're in the best place ever to walk in the faith that he has given us. The assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Because don't forget, it wasn't uh, like Daniel chapter 1, the very, first, the very first verse, it says that the Lord gave 
Nebuchadnezzar victory over, over Israel. It was God who did that. That's a hard one to swallow sometimes, but the reality is, can we trust our God? Can we trust the Lord to work anything for his good? Can we trust him? I, I believe we can, and I believe we need to, and I believe we're coming to a time when we're going to watch us, we're going to experience that like none other. Lord, we just, we come in this moment and we recognize the, our, our deep need for you. We recognize our need for your spirit to fill us and to lead us. We recognize our, our weaknesses. And Lord, exile is here because of sin. And we want to do that. We want to come and we want to repent. Lord, we want to keep short accounts with you. David wrote in a psalm, Lord, cast, cast me not away from your presence. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who would walk well in exile, that we would represent you well in exile as we rub shoulders with people around us that don't know you. That we would represent you well, that we would be ambassadors that, that model who you are, your grace and your love and your power and your conviction. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.